You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic, and welcome to episode 142, which we have a, a recurring guest today, Fran. Yeah, I like that. We don't do that too often. There's not. We, we talk about a lot, and we get requested to do it a lot to revisit some of the guests that we've had on, but uh, we there's never... so many things we want to talk about <laughs> that are new that, um, that we end up not going back that often. But we are today, and that's a good thing because today we have Sam Hoadley, uh, who was originally on episode 68. Wow, that's that long ago. Yeah, and so, Sam, you're the the trial garden manager for Mount Cuba Center, which has a major focus on native plants, Um, and you guys just did something new. In fact, I have it sitting right here in front of me. I have your – I got it in the mail the other day, so I have your – Frank, can you see it? I do. You know, it's funny because we just (laughs) just redid our offices over the weekend, and I found my hydrangea one. Oh, Uh, yeah. yeah. (laughs) But we have the the new uh, Carex uh, trials for the Mid-Atlantic report. I had it sitting right next to this bottle of <laughs> what's a cactus, cactus juice, cactus juice snops that was uh. given to me. Someone pulled it out of their parents' liquor closet. <laughs> but, yeah, maybe we have a shot later. <laughs> so, and this is just where it ended up. But yeah. Um, yeah, no, we're excited to talk about this. We've already gotten a lot of questions about it, both from the sales side of things, where friends mm-hmm. answer on the phone because people are interested in in carrots because they saw this report come out, and then podcast listeners too, where they're going online and sharing this report and saying, hey, I'd love to learn more about this stuff. So, And sometimes it's tough to digest all that just looking through the report because there's a lot of information. So this way maybe we can narrow it down a little bit and give give some of the highlights, some of the things you need to know, and and spread the excitement about this. So yeah. I thought it would be great. Like we kind of gave you an introduction, but if you could just remind our listeners about who you are, what your role is in Mount Cuba, and the mission of the Trial Gardens. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you both very much for having me back. It's, it's always a pleasure. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm Sam Hoadley. I, I manage the trial garden here at Mount Cuba Center, um, where we're kind of where we're evaluating native plants um, from two perspectives, um, which ties directly back to our mission, where we want to inspire people by the beauty and value of native plants, um, hopefully inspire people to become conservators themselves in their home landscapes by planting natives. Um, it's a great way for you to become a conservator yourself. Um, but we think about the beauty of native plants as their ornamental qualities. We're evaluating, you know, are these tough plants? Are they attractive garden plants in the mid-Atlantic region? Which plants would a homeowner be successful with if they were to choose, um, especially if they were top-performing plants from our trials? Um, and then we're also looking at the value of native plants, which is um, we interpret that as the wildlife value um, and specifically pollinator value, which we've looked at um, in several of our past trials, including wild hydrangea. Um, and echinacea, including several others. Um, we're still, we're actually currently looking at um, the same kind of question with goldenrods and iron meats currently. Um, but yeah, so we're kind of, we're focused on both of those perspectives and we're running uh, trials on native plants. Um, we generally have four trials running at any given time and trials can range anywhere from three to five years, depending on if they're an herbaceous perennial, generally three years. And woody plants, we've generally been doing about a five-year process for that. So when you think of native plants, I'm trying to think of a way to phrase this. Like you think of hy- hydrangeas can be very sexy or, or echinacea, <laughs> and now we're talking about carrots, which in in the trade, you know, they're very useful and they have their purpose, but not a lot of people get very excited about. Yeah. Uh, what was behind going into carrots uh, and making that a choice when you think of all these other flowering plants that have pollinator – like? higher value pollinator uh, status. What what was the choice to say, hey, we should really look at Carex? Yeah, so, I mean, as you mentioned with hydrangea and like with echinacea and some of our previous trials, it's very easy to promote those plants. They're colorful, they're attractive. Everyone wants one in their garden. Um, and I think uh, we're in this unique position where we can kind of be champions for under underappreciated plants or plants we think should be utilized more. Um, and in addition to that, if we can add something to the conversation, if we can 
add more information or make things more user friendly. Um, that's something we really want to do as well. And I think Carex fit into that, that category of needing that champion and also needing a little bit more information so that people can make good informed decisions when using them in their home landscape. There's a lot of Carex out there. And I think sometimes it can be overwhelming um, about where to start, where, how do I use these things? How versatile are they? Um, and that's another thing we wanted to highlight. Carex are incredibly adaptable and versatile. And we wanted to showcase that as well and just really promote them as a garden plant that, and there really is a Carex for every home landscape. And, and when you, when you think of when, when we're looking at restorations, they're almost a part with the exception of, of salt marsh. They're a part of almost every restoration and a very important part in large quantities. And when you talk about the amount of species, yeah, I mean, they range from permanent inundation to, to high and dry to kind of cover the whole spectrum, right. but there's right. so many and some of them are so close. It's hard to, I, my identification, you know, I may be good on three or four, you know, and then, sure. then <laughs> yeah. it's, then but, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's, it's a lot, it's, it's something that's very important, but we never look deeper into it. We know they're there and, and mm-hmm. it needs to be a part of it. So given the excitement of past trials, before we get into the meat and potatoes of the trial, what, sure. what are some of the, the reception to, to the results of this trial now that it's, it's out in the world? What has been some of the feedback? People are overwhelmingly excited about it. Um, I think we've had probably the most positive response just as an organization um, to this to this research report in comparison to some of our past reports. And we've always had good responses and people are excited, um, but we've been getting lots of feedback about the Carex report. Um, and we have uh, classes uh, coming up. I'm teaching a class next Wednesday um, on February 1st. Um, that is filling up quickly. I think it has the most um, class registrants of a class that we've we've put out there, um, which is really exciting. And it's just it's great to see that there is that excitement. People are into Carex. They want to know more. Um, yeah, we would hope that there would be that excitement, but but you never know. Um, and we're really really excited to see that um, see the reality kind of match that that hope and expectation. Well, without connecting the dots, we started getting calls immediately, and and we're wholesale to the trade, but we we're getting homeowner calls asking us about Carex that we weren't even familiar with. You know, we we're getting questions like, "Hey, do you know? Do you sell Carex Woody Eye to anyone that I'd be able?" To? I'm like, I'm not even. And yeah. then it started like we started piecing it together. We're like, oh. This, I, I understand where <laughs> yeah. this is coming from, and we hadn't received that before on past trials, this one specifically. Um, right. And before we, we – again, before we talk about it, you mentioned classes. Where can where can our listeners get more information about classes if they're in your area mm-hmm. that they can learn more about this? Yeah, so um, it just – Log on to mountcubacenter.org um, uh, slash programs, and you can okay. get a look at all of our classes and events. Um, there's a lot of great classes that we offer, both virtually and in person. Um, the class on Carex on February 1st is virtual, um, so you can log in um, and view it. And then there's also an in-person class, which I think is unfortunately sold out okay. um, on Carex in the next uh, couple weeks from then. But there's many other classes. It's definitely worth taking a dive and seeing what those offerings I, are. Mm-hmm. I think that's something I'd be interested in. Yeah, oh, or, yeah, or some of our our staff might be really interested in in being a yeah. part of the virtual one. Because, like you mentioned, Fran, um, <laughs> there's so many different kinds of of carrots out there, and so many that we aren't familiar with. And uh, and for a long time, I and this is in part because we're a wetland nursery. I always just assumed all carrots were wetland plants, and. Uh, and I knew there was like well, Carex Pennsylvanica was an upland, which is plant, a big part of the pine but, barrens. Yeah, but um, I didn't know how many Carex <clears throat> were actually upland plants as compared to wetland plants until I went to the trial garden saw and, and Sam kind of showed me. Oh yeah, these ones. This is a good upland one. This is a good upland one. So what was the breakdown between like wetland Carex that you tried versus upland Carex that you tried? Honestly, I'm not sure what the the percentage is, but I would say it's. Probably somewhere in the 50 50 to 60 40 range, where maybe 40% were wetland plants. Oh, wow. And maybe 60% were, were up. Um, but it's, it was neat. We had we had a Carex that's native to the sand dunes, um, Carex silicia, so grow, very dry grower, full sun, not at all what I kind of had originally thought of as you know, where you would find Carex. I was similar to you, Tom, when I started. I was like, oh, you know, wet shade is where yeah. you find yep. Carex. Yep. Um, and then, you know, um, in conversations with Bill McAvoy, our state botanist, who was really instrumental in the planning and execution of this trial, 
it really was so enlightening um, learning about carex. I mean, in Delaware alone, we have 137 species of carex. Wow. Um, which is amazing. Um, and if you think about the trial, we only had 70 different accessions. Um, and I think that really represented 65 species. So while that was a big accumulation of plants, it's kind of a, not quite a drop in the bucket, but it's not necessarily a comprehensive trial either. Um, but it was, it was just fascinating to learn that diversity of both the plants themselves and also those habitats in which they're found. Now, you mentioned the one that was native to sand dunes. Is that coastal sand dunes? or yep. So is it safe to assume that it has a salt tolerance? I would assume so, yep. That was yeah. one thing that we saw, um, especially after Hurricane Sandy with the restorations because so much area was impacted yes. that there was a slight salinity to soil that – wasn't traditionally or historically mm-hmm. there that restoration started to take place they had a lot of carex uh on on the projects and they all started to die and they couldn't understand why and it was the salinity in the soil and i wasn't familiar with any carex with with uh salt tolerance so that's fabulous to hear i mean that's a great that's a great tool right there yeah it's an interesting species i don't know if it's widely cultivated but i've seen it in you know, rock outcrops in Maine that, you know, at times are touched by the salt water. So there must be some tolerance. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. And it's for us, for education, this is so invaluable to us because it's this weird loop where when we see restorations and and I want to talk more about the value for homeowners because this is, I think, where part of the excitement is, but we, we grow what we see specified. But it's hard to say what's specified is based on what nurseries grow. <laughs> so you think you're getting feedback from the engineers and the architects, but you're really not. They're basing it on what they see in catalogs. So we need this type of information to know what's important, what's out there, so we can expand what's available to that trade and even other growers that are growing it for retail. But it seems that so many homeowners – are looking, you know, we talked about with Dr. Peter Grothman, there was an article, they fought the lawn and they won. And people are looking for those lawn replacements. And especially here in the, the temperate northeast, it's it's not as easy to find those lawn replacements. And I think this is like the hope people are seeing this and saying, we, we have a shot at this. And I think yeah. that's that's part of the excitement. What are what were some of the surprises of the trial when you when you get into this? There, you know, there's there's a reason why people are excited about it. What were some of the things maybe you didn't expect that were very pleasant surprises as as you got into this one? Yeah, I think a couple of the things were just the incredible adaptability of many of the species in the trial. Um, we we kind of pushed some of their tolerances. We grew so we grew all seventy of these different carrots in both full sun and and shade, about sixty percent shade. Um, and it was just fascinating to see what percentage of plants really did well in both. Um, so those plants really represent to me kind of a common element mm-hmm. you can use to, you know, tie plantings together where you might have a shady area next to a full sun area. This can be kind of a common theme that you can use throughout that planting. Um, I think the other piece of it is um, their tolerance to mowing. Um, we did a mowing trial that last year. There was, there was four years of a regular trial and a single year of mowing where we mowed the plants um, every two weeks, starting at the beginning of May and ending in August or late August. And it was really fascinating to see the plant's response. Overwhelmingly, the plants tolerated it. And then it just kind of became, you know, which ones actually look good while they're surviving in this kind of treatment. Um, and we had kind of a short list of plants that could be potential mode lawn replacements, although there are many carrot species that would be a really great candidate for a no-mo situation where you may have to only maintain that once a year if that. Um, so it's just, it was really kind of a testament to the tolerance of these plants, the adaptability of these plants, um, what they can go through in a, in a cultivated situation and survive and thrive. One of the, you know, without you know, realizing what, yeah. what, you know, when you think of carrots and a lawn replacement, you don't necessarily think of mowing. I think some people are looking to put things in that just right. stay small that they don't have to mow. I right. had never thought about it. My old property backed up to the New Jersey Turnpike. There was a buffer, and then there was a pipelines that were traditional wetlands that they didn't alter. That was all lurid sedge that the wow. pipeline yeah. company would mow. And I didn't realize it was even lurid sedge until they didn't mow it. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> because it filled in and created like a pretty good lawn. I was like, oh, wow, this is actually – I hadn't thought about this. You know, <laughs> you, you could have the best of both worlds without without knowing it. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't have the same wildlife value if you're mowing it, but at least it's a right. natural grass and not – not. Right. but it's not something I would have thought of as a, a lawn replacement until they actually mowed it like a lawn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, I mean, a lot of the plants just, um, you know, again, they tolerated it. Um, Bird sedge is one of them that did perfectly fine. And when you stop mowing it, it just pops up and often will bloom and seed. Um, it's kind of amazing what's in lawns if you just stop mowing them. And it's, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it was, and again, there's plenty of species that you don't have to mow, um, like Eucaris alocans, Bromoides, Pennsylvanica. There's tons of species that would be a really great candidate for extremely low maintenance plantings like that. Yeah. And what were some other species that were great, like kind of low lying uh, or flopped a little bit that also fit? You mentioned Carex Pennsylvanica, uh, Carex albicans. Were there any other species that performed really well in those conditions? Um, as far as the mowing goes, uh, there were several species that were that were really, really good. So Carex pensylvanica and Carex woodyi, to me, were some of the best. Um, we've mentioned Carex woodyi before. Um, it's very similar in application to Carex pensylvanica. Low-growing plant, rhizomatous. Um, Carex woodyi is a little bit better at suppressing weeds than Carex pensylvanica. Mm-hmm. Um, but they handle mowing really well. And really the advantage of these two plants is that they can, they're can they rhizomatous. They're going to kind of continue to knit together and fill in gaps. Um and they're low growing anyways. Um, and a lot of their, their stem structures are below ground. So you're not going to be disturbing that as you're mowing. Um, uh, Carex Ebernia was really exciting. Um, I think for certain applications, I think dry shade, um, would be a really great place to utilize Carex Ebernia. Um, definitely an upland said very fine texture, very slow growing. Um, it's essentially a clump former that will spread very slowly by rhizomes after it's established. But if you plant enough of them, you could get some good coverage um, and kind of fill in some trouble spots, if you will, um, that might be difficult for traditional um, turf grass lawns. Um, Carex socialis, um, which was has been getting kind of a lot of buzz in the nursery industry lately, um, that one handled mowing really well and actually improved the plant, um, which kind of made me think that this is maybe a species that responds to disturbance um, potentially. Um, but it actually really, like, it created a very beautiful, dense clump um, that was very difficult for, I would imagine it would be difficult for weeds to kind of invade into. Um, and then Karis James, yeah, was great. Um, did well in the trial as well. Just a beautiful dark green clumping sedge. Um, you'd have to plant a lot of them just because you are, they are clump forming plants. Um, but they would do a great job as a as either a no mow or a mowed lawn situation. And really all of these species would be perfectly fine as a no mow as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and just um, for folks who aren't familiar with, like, Pennsylvania sedge, yeah, how tall does that get? And, like, even some of the other ones you mentioned, how tall do those typically get? Um, yeah, um, so we, I think, a little over a foot is kind of their maximum, mm-hmm. and that's kind of bloom. Those are where those leaf tips are kind of getting to. For the majority of the year, as that foliage starts to mat down, I would think eight to nine inches is going to be kind yeah. of that that zone where it's going to where it's going to sit. Carex woody eye, very very similar, maybe just a shade taller, um, but that's they're what we categorize as small, if you will, as far yeah. as height. Yeah. Um, generally, we said about a foot or smaller would be um, in that small category. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, good to know because I know a lot of our listeners that. Uh, or one of the more common complaints we get is, oh, I live in a development and we have an HOA and there's restrictions on how tall stuff can get and um, they're challenged to mow. So I'm just, when we're talking about this, I'm thinking, oh, okay, you can let it grow and let it get a little taller. And then if you get a complaint, you have something that you know you can mow, um, but yeah. maybe you're not mowing biweekly or weekly. It's it's monthly or even a little bit longer than that sometimes. Maybe you get away yeah. with mowing twice a summer and um yeah. and you can still kind of have that that ecological component and uh, appease the HOA folks at the same time. I I always yeah. advocate you should just join the HOA and and convert them <laughs> from the inside. The uh, what's That's that right. a splinter yeah. cell? Is yeah. what it's called? <laughs> there you go. Get on the board yourself. Yeah. yeah. Get on the board yourself yeah. and then yeah, then uh then form teams and and what what was that? There was that show House of Cards, oh, and it's yeah. like you can be the whip trying to get people. <laughs> to get inside. Were, but, were there any surprises as far as pollinator diversity um, 
that that came out of this. Like I said, I, I'm not saying that they're void of pollinator uh, uses, but it's not something we think about when we think about pollinators. Right. So, so that was a challenge for this trial, and and most of our trials, we are you know looking at that pollinator interaction, wildlife value of these plants, um, and that was really hard to measure with the carex. We had anecdotal observations where we were seeing insects, um, invertebrates. Um, even amphibians living in the carex trial, in particular the shady areas of the of the, the trial, um, and you know frogs, toads that we wouldn't see in the trial garden otherwise. Um, they were there because the carex was there, providing good cover, good habitat, um, keeping that good humid layer right at the soil level. Um, but again, difficult to measure with the the pollinator trials or trials that are interacting with pollinators. We can count pollinators and get some kind of basic metric for measuring their potential value in a home landscape. With the carex, a lot of it's from literature um, and essentially anecdotal observations that we observed in the trial. We know that carex seeds are good for birds. They're good for mammals. Um, we know that the carex are providing cover. Um, we know that some carex species are host plants. Um, and once we started looking for that, we started finding caterpillars, which was really, really cool. Um, in one case, we found a caterpillar of a yellow college scape moth, um, really interesting species, feeding on the foliage of carex herdfolia. Um, and later that season, we saw the adult moths feeding on the goldenrods within the trial garden. Um, so it was really fascinating to see this species of moth completing its entire life cycle in the trial garden, which is a very artificial space um, and can be replicated quite easily in a home landscape. And it just kind of re- drove home to me um, that idea that even in a, in a small home landscape, it's artificial, but you're filling it with native plants and have wildlife value. You can be supporting insects and wildlife um, you know, in your home garden, um, which is really exciting. Uh, and that's, that's, that's something that's hard to talk about sometimes because <clears throat> like we know, especially from talking with Dr. Emil DeVito from the uh, New Jersey Conservation uh, – NJCF, was it? New Jersey Conservation Foundation. Foundation yeah. See, and now I'm doing it. I no. do it all the time where I screw <laughs> – I, I, I say he works for the completely wrong organization all the time. So. But that we know Carrots Pennsylvania and the Pine Barrens is very important habitat for rattlesnake, um, mm-hmm. and, and they use that for cover, and that's not what – some people want to hear <laughs> when right. think about wow. using as a lawn, but that wildlife habitat is very important because you it, you're yes. contributing to the food web. You need to support all of that to keep it balanced and in check. So it's just an important feature to think about for some of these things. Yeah. Of what else does it like? Does it help other than not mowing a lawn? Yeah, it it performs a lot of other functions, and that's why they're important right. and are as native plants for us. Right. We saw we have a very similar situation where there's wildlife interactions that you may not observe in your backyard, but they are critically important in the wild. Um, in one um, specific scenario, um, we grow Carex uh, stricta for the state of Delaware. Um, and the state then plants out the Carex stricta in suitable bog turtle habitat. And bog turtles an endangered species of turtle in um, eastern North America. Um, and they use Carex stricta, basically those um, elevated um, tussocks of Carex stricta, to lay their eggs and nest in. Um, they're actually seeing bog turtles nesting in those Carex um, stricta that we've grown and um, sent back out into the wild. So it's fascinating that those interactions both exist um, and that there's actual conservation initiatives that can work um, in those kinds of scenarios. And yeah. for our listeners that don't know, Carex stricta, uh, which is tussock's edge, can take up to six inches of permanent inundation. So when you think of protecting yes. habitat and you have these tussocks that are six inches into the water, you're – preventing some wildlife from from attacking those eggs so it is protecting it just based on where it's located yeah and that's that's interesting i'm look. i'm as we're talking i'm paging through the report and like so what we're talking about and um yeah you have the picture of the the turtle nest in here and i've walked around we have like that wet meadow behind our farm i walked around there there's all kinds of different carrots in there and it's like man that looks like a great place to, to hide if i was a <laughs> dog or like so a duck or something like that. that would be the perfect spot and um, yeah, no, but yeah. that's how animals are actually using it that way. That's awesome. Now you you, you yeah. mentioned the the challenge of pollinators. Were there any other challenges that that came up that you you didn't expect as you were working through the trial uh, trial? Um, not too many with the, the carex trial. Um, okay. With a lot of with a lot of trials, where uh, you know disease is a big component. We're talking about flocks or Menarda, powdery mildew is a major issue. Um, with the ironweed trial, um, rust is a big issue. Uh, with the carex, there was very, very few disease components. Um, there was only 
a handful of times that the carracks were damaged in any way um, from an, a factor outside of us um, just basically neglecting these plants. Um, but uh, one issue that we had was with bulls, um, especially with some of the more evergreen species of carracks, like carracks uh, cherokeensis. Um, and it, I think really those plants are providing cover for those animals, um, which again, you're gardening to invite wildlife in your home landscape. So you can't get too upset when the wildlife is utilizing your landscape. It's like, no, not that kind of wildlife. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things that to be aware of, and it may happen, um, but it's basically providing those, um, the bulls with cover. And what they're doing is essentially eating the um, below ground um, portions of that plant. They rarely kill them, however. Um, and often the carrots cherokeensis would bounce back, bounce back the next year and they would be perfectly fine. Um, but it's just something to keep an eye out for. That was really the only like bigger disease or um, pest consideration that we may have had from that trial. What, you know, a big thing for what I just heard you say when you were talking about there weren't very many disease issues. The first thing I thought of, you already had mentioned that it was a 40 60 split between wetland and upland. So not all these plants in the, in the trial are in their ideal conditions and typically when plants aren't in their ideal conditions you you really get to see what stresses them and what diseases so if you can oh yeah stress these plants and not have them in their ideal conditions and still not have any notable disease issues that's pretty significant to me that's that's a huge takeaway yeah and there were some species really like were intolerant of, um, you know, maybe they were shade uh, species you would find in the shade in the wild, and when we put them in full sun, it just didn't work. Yeah. Um, one of our top performers like that was like that, uh, Carex plantagenia. Um, when we put it in full sun, it just burned up, and the plants didn't survive the trial. But in shade, it was a fabulous plant for the duration of the five years. Um, so there are plants that maybe weren't as tolerant, and others that were incredibly tolerant. And even plants that maybe wouldn't want to be in full sun, or maybe would have preferred to have more water when they were grown in full sun, mm-hmm. you might have seen a little bit of yellowing and a little bit of stress, and maybe those plants wouldn't have achieved kind of the, the dimensions that they would in the wild. But they still performed, and they still looked pretty good. Um, it was just really amazing to me the adaptability of these plants, even just in you know average cultivation, um, average garden settings. Were there any – I don't want to say losers because when you're talking about native plants, there's no there's no losers because right. they all have their their purpose. Sure. Um, but was there anything that that didn't perform well in general, like and, even in its ideal? Yeah, and I'd even add is was there anything that you went in with really high expectations for and it didn't live up to its expectations? There, we always have our favorites, um, and I try to <laughs> try to not be biased when we're doing these trials and to just be as objective as possible. Um, Carex gray eye um, is I love that species. Um, it has those beautiful um, kind of like mace looking um, seed heads that are really spectacular in the landscape. We use it extensively in the naturalistic gardens in Mount Cuba, and it didn't quite get to the top performer level. Um, but we do try to anytime a plant doesn't perform. Um, in the trials, we try to look at it um, and try to explain maybe why that may have been and then try to suggest where you could use it, where you could be successful with this plant. As you mentioned, um, this trial was very heavily species weighted. Um, we had 65 species we were looking at, and there's not a bad species. It's just it may not be in the situation that it would prefer um, and where it would be performing best. Um, um, yeah. So um, what we have done is we've tried to um, suggest where you could be growing these plants, where you'd have more success with them. Um, we have an, actually an ex, a downloadable Excel file on our website um, that you can download and sort through based on really whatever traits you want, um, whether that you wanted to sort for plants that would prefer to be growing in dry soils or wet soils, full sun, shade, um, and other things like whether it's an evergreen plant, semi-evergreen, whether it has attractive flowers, really whatever you're looking for, you can generate lists. Um, because again, there's not a bad plant. It's just about using that plant in the correct situation. That's that's an invaluable blueprint. Uh, it's invaluable, especially for for home gardeners that are looking to incorporate these. Because you're not dealing with natural conditions or natural soils, and to to have this right. information to be able to have confidence. You know, we all want success to to be able right. to take these plants home. The, I, I guess the biggest thing is going to be finding these some of these uh, species, which hopefully this kickstarts these into more nursery production but to be able to know hey i really this would work for me but it's not the right conditions but it appears that it can handle that 
you know, that's that's something that without these trials, you're going to have a lot of trial and error from homeowners, and you're just right. you're you're just offering success to these people. Right. So where where can they? You, you mentioned that uh, downloadable form is on your website. Do you know exactly the link? I was going to ask where our listeners could find the results for this. Yeah, it's, um, so it's not Cuba Center. It's just mtcubacenter.org slash trials. Um, and then you can navigate to the various trials you've completed. The most recent one on that page is Carex. Um, and then you scroll down right below the PDF, the downloadable PDF, which is free. Um, uh, it, has, it has the download the Excel sheet link. Um, and uh, in addition to having that free PDF, you can pick up hard copies of the research report when we open up in April, April 1st. So. Yeah. yeah, and if yeah. you're having any trouble uh, finding the, the uh, page for the report and all that, just go to any, like, Native Plant Facebook group, and you'll see at least seven to ten postings <laughs> within the last week. There's so one in the Native Plants Healthy it's, Plant it's Facebook been, group. Yeah. Like I've said, it's been shared all over the place from what I've seen, So, which is exciting. It's, um, yeah, it's great. We mentioned in the beginning great. it's uh, not like the sexy species that you think of, but uh, but it's got a lot of people excited about it, which is awesome. Were there any cultivars yeah. as part of part of this trial? Yes, I think there's about five, um, okay. and they were all collections. Um, two of them were from Carex muscingumensis. One of them is a very compact selection that was um, made in uh, Pennsylvania um, called Little Midge. It's just very minute, um, could be interesting in a container. It might be harder to incorporate into a naturalistic design, but very interesting plant. Um, and then there's another cultivar called Omi, um, which has kind of subtle variegation on the leaf margins. Um, it's not as showy as um, you'd see a lot of the non-native Carex, like uh, Carex oceanensis. You have that really strong, um, creamy variegation. It's not quite as striking, but it is there. Um, and it's interesting. I think if you are, if that kind of thing appeals to you, there are some native Carex out there that are different um, and might be an interesting um, cor- to incorporate in your garden in limited numbers. Um, but cultivars were definitely not the, the focus of this evaluation. Yeah. What was cool, I, the picture in your report of Little Midge and how if you look over top, it has that like honeycomb pattern is yeah. fascinating. I, I was like, ooh, that's a cool one. I want to buy one and put it in a pot and then just look at it all day. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. No, it's, it's- it's a totally interesting plant. Yeah. Um, it was it was one of the weird carrots in the trial that never bloomed. Um, oh. We had, had one species that didn't bloom just because it kind of failed to thrive and didn't persist throughout the evaluation. But Little Midge was actually one of our top performers, did exceptionally well in both sun and shade, um, came back strong every single year. I just never bloomed. Um, yeah. So we were actually starting to wonder, you know, is this actually a carex? Are we looking at um, a dicanthelium or, or, you know, not a... Um, uh, not a dicanthelium, but there's some other um, sedges that are carex adjacent that are very similar. Um, but we did have it confirmed; it is a muscingensis. Um, it's just, it's just a little bit weird. Yeah. Um, but cool. And that brings up a, a, another good question: is what had um, or which carex did you find that had like a showier flower? Um, or were there any, or were there very few? Oh, sure. I mean, there's so. Carex flowers, I tend to look at as kind of a nice bonus. Uh, we tend to be looking at these plants for their year-round presence in the garden, mm-hmm. foliage, um, their habit in the garden are all you know things that were really the focus of this trial. Um, but there were a few species that I think would be worth growing just for their flowers. Um, Carex woody eye had absolutely spectacular flowers, um, just kind of carpets of straw-colored flowers in late April and early May. Um, Carex pensylvanica, the straight species, has very subtle flowers, but there was a cultivar that was introduced by Brent Horvath of Intrinsic Perennials um, that has very showy flowers at all as well, um, kind of similar in appearance to Carex woody eye. Um, then a couple of the wetland species have really beautiful flowers. The Carex stricta we, men- we mentioned earlier is spectacular when it blooms. And there's a very closely related species um, that did well in the trial as well called Carex hedenii. It just is this beautiful fountain of flowers that kind of looks like, I think I described in the report as like white and cream colored pipe cleaners, like kind of erupting out of this. this oh, that, that's um, not, yeah, that sounds amazing. It's really beautiful. Um, and, and, and there was a, one, of, one of the surprises in the trial, um, a plant that's not in cultivation to my knowledge, um, but I think deserves a place in gardens, um, is Carex jorii. 
Um, a lot of our Carex bloom very early in the year in the trial. So it would be late April to early May would be kind of that first flush. A lot of the early blooming species bloom there. We actually had a couple that bloom in kind of mid-March. Carex ebernia and Carex plantaginia bloom really early in the year. And then we have kind of that second flush kind of late May to early June. And then, you know, you kind of think, okay, Carex are kind of done for the year. Um, and I remember coming back from vacation in late July, um, the first year of the, the Carex trial, and seeing um, Carex jurii in full, like, glorious bloom. It was absolutely spectacular. So it was very unexpected, unique in the trial, not necessarily unique to the genus, um, but just kind of an unexpected, spectacular bloom. Um, I think in our Carex anatomy section, we had a good picture of what the Carex jurii flowers look like. It's a really spectacular species. I, I love that you mentioned the diversity of bloom times as far as yeah. blooming early, blooming late, when you, when you think of, uh, the importance in a landscape that way to be able to stagger those bloom times to help with pollinators. That's yeah. that's wonderful. And then to, yeah. to play off of that, how about seed heads? Was I was thinking, had yes. car- like in my yeah. head, I started thinking about Carex intumescence, which is bladder sedge, which has yeah. that very descriptive seed pod. I didn't know if that was one that was part of the trial or if you had any other. Yes. No, it was beautiful. And the seed heads to me are they are some of the most beautiful and interesting structures you can include in a landscape. Um, Carrick's uh, gray eyes I mentioned before is really spectacular. Just this amazing, I don't know, this spiky Sputnik um, spheres that, that kind of are born all over this, this plant that are just, they're beautiful. Um, and they last for a longer period of time. A lot of the Carrick's flowers are fairly short lived. Um, it's about a week or so. And they're kind of, they've kind of gone through their peak, at least the male flowers, which tend to be the showier part have kind of finished blooming. Um, and, but those seed heads do persist for a much longer period of time. Um, I think Carex typhina and sporosa are really attractive. Those, cat, those cattail sedges are really attractive. Um, uh, Carex cranita has kind of these pendulous tassels of, um, of seeds um, or fruit, and they're beautiful as well. When you start looking at those textures and you start kind of honing in on those details of the seeds, um, especially, you know, those inflated perigenia and the akines of Carex, there is so much beauty there and so much interest, and you can really get lost down the rabbit hole of, of looking at those structures, and and then, then you get into the ID side of it, which, I don't know, I'll, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I think the, the, the fruit bodies are great. So, I, and, so. I want to talk about ID, but I just want to say… If you're a listener and you're not excited about Carex right now, <laughs> I don't know what else we can do because this is yeah. – you know, when you start really looking at it, really looking at it, the beauty of it, we're talking about flowers, seed pods, uh, texture and, and leaf blade and heights and bloom times. There's so much diversity that you don't get with a lot of other plants. Other plants may be prettier at first sight, but it's short-lived. When you think of mm-hmm. the value that you get throughout the whole year, the diversity, and and how much it can mean to your landscape in so many different ways, it's hard not to kind of fall in love with this plant. Now, yeah. you, you you did mention um, IDing. How, I would imagine I know how hard that is to ID, and sometimes it's the length of the the flower stalk that will differentiate two species. How hard was that as part of the part of the trial, just knowing that you had the right plant? Because it's, it's it's so yeah. difficult. It's it is very challenging, and and there are certain carrots that you can look at them and with very um, very mm-hmm. few upper clues, maybe even besides the foliage, and you know what species you're looking at. Like carrots plantaginia comes to mind. You see those leaves that kind of pleated on um, leaf surface, and you're like, yep, that's that species. Um, and then there are others where. Um, especially in certain sections. So Carex, the Carex genus is broken up into sections, which are basically groups of very closely related plants. Some of those sections are really difficult to tell those species apart. Um, Carex, uh, the section ovalis is really like, um, has a reputation for being really difficult to key out to species. And when you're looking at them, um, it often comes down to the perigenia. So that's that kind of um, sheath that encloses those Carex seeds, um, which are also known as achenes. But it's kind of looking at the geometry of those those perigenia and those achenes, um, their shapes, their textures, their colors. Um, that's often what it kind of comes down to. Um, and for myself, which I still consider myself uh, a layman as far as Carex go, um, it's challenging um, with some of these Carex. And um, again, we were just so fortunate to have Bill McAvoy, our, the Delaware State Botanist, helping us and um, verifying um, some of those edges. And some of the plants that came in, 
Um, and some of the plants in our collection were actually, we ended up having to update their names um, mm. because at certain times um, there were a few that maybe were misidentified or maybe the name was updated. Um, and it's just an invaluable um, resource to have someone like Bill who's, who has that expertise, um, not just in Carex, I should say, but really in all stitches. So I just, I, I didn't want our listeners to get overwhelmed. That's hard for people that are even trained to do it, to be able to properly yeah. identify these. So it's, it's don't feel overwhelmed or that it's impossible. It's just, you know, go, buy from reputable places that you you can trust that are identifying plants correctly, and and you should be good. So, um, yeah, absolutely. Were there any? I was just thinking lifespan. Were there any surprises where you found that maybe the lifespan of some of these were shorter than what? Expect? Like, did any any of them not last the full five years just because it wasn't their their lifespan? I'm not sure if it's lifespan or if it was just they weren't in the right situation um, as far as like cultural conditions go. So for Carex Appalachica, for example, very popular landscape mm-hmm. plant in the right situation, but it just didn't prove to be adaptable to what I would consider to be average garden soils. That's a plant that really wants to be in, in areas with better drainage. Um, and it does great in Mount Cuba Center's naturalistic gardens. Um, we have it planted on hillsides where it's beautiful. It mixes beautifully with other shade perennials in particular but it just kind of slowly faded out through the, to the through the duration of the evaluation. But that's another one we tried to we tried to illustrate that it's again not a bad plant, just wasn't growing in the right situation or where it wanted to be growing. Um, there were certain plants that um, we'll call it kind of like the donut effect or the bird's nest effect, where the center of the plant slowly starts to die out after we started to see that after about three years in the trial, um, and you kind of get this living ring of growth kind of on the perimeter of that clump. Um, and that's just something that's, it's not necessarily bad, but, um, certain home gardeners at that point may want to, you know, at year three, keep an eye out for it and divide those plants. And then you'll refresh and reinvigorate those plants. Um, and that's one of the advantages to actually having this trial run a little bit longer, not necessarily a bad thing, but again, just something to keep an eye out for, Mm -hmm. um, as far as short lived, again, difficult to tell whether that was true lifespan or just, um, poor cultural conditions for that species. Some plants are just hard to replicate um, and get in the right spot. Like I'm not thinking of a carrots, but I was thinking of bearberry. Um, mm-hmm. Like we oh, sure. see where it grows in the pine barrens. It seems it's all over. But if you even try to replicate that in a nursery setting, the plant is so picky it doesn't necessarily respond the same way. And I didn't yeah. know if some of those conditions like carex Appalachia have that a similar feel to that. Like you think of uh, Gaultheria percumbens, wintergreen. That's another one that – it's just yeah. like you can grow it in a nursery setting, but then if you try to plant it back out, it never really wants to survive. Like it's very right. picky that way. But naturally it will come up, you know, in the, the right conditions all the time, but just trying to establish it becomes difficult. So um I I don't see that being a problem with Carex. That's the one thing I was thinking about, just transplanting some of those. Like when you started out, how were the plants were they started from seed, were they started from bare root plugs? Like how were – was it a mixture? Yeah. It was a mixture. So some were started from seeds, some were um, some were bare root, and a lot of them were kind of court to plug size. Um, so they um, – by the time they all went into the trial garden, though, they were roughly at an equal footing of mm-hmm. established material in pots. Um, we weren't direct sowing anything like that. Any any seeds that came in were grown in our greenhouse, and then we were um, established plants by the time they went to the garden. I don't know if this is something that the the trial encompasses. I do know that some carrots are easy to do from seed, and some are near in pot, like carrots Pennsylvania doesn't really want to produce a viable seed. So a lot of the right. times, nursery production is done via divisions, uh, where carrot right. stricta you mm-hmm. can grow from seed. Like, is there any information based on on that that goes through, or is it they're not there long enough to really get into that yeah well, it's not something we got into um very much in the trial um but it is you know it's a valid um aspect of the genus carex they are some of them are challenging from seed others are really straightforward we did see some species that were um you know would seed in pretty readily others that we never saw any seedling recruitment at all um and maybe we just weren't in the right situation or maybe we needed other um genetically Dissimilar individuals of that same species to produce viable seed. Um, it's it's interesting. Um, and then there was also the question about whether these carrots could hybridize in the trial garden, especially a lot of species that were blooming at the same time. 
Um, and a lot of the thinking currently is that um, carex within the same section, so those closely related species can hybridize in theory. There are natural hybrids that occur, um, but in a lot of cases, um, carex in different sections won't cross. And then you have um, species like carex jorii and carex plantaginia that are blooming on very um, ends of those spectrum, the bloom periods. So you're just not going to be blooming at other at similar times as other plants. So you have almost no chance of being cross pollinated by some, a different species. With with the results of this and the buzz around it, my prediction is in the next five to ten years we're going to see an influx of cultivars, <laughs> carrots cultivars. <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. I yeah. which which you know Tom and I. Ever since that we talked to you on episode sixty eight, we've kind of changed our views on cultivars. Like mm-hmm. like that was a very insightful conversation for us and meant a lot to us and actually shifted our perception. So we I don't know if we've ever even said thank you for that, but I guess we should pre- say thank you for that. Oh, sure. <laughs> so, no, I think they have a, a valid place in the native plant conversation. It's just, you know, making informed decisions and you know, we can talk about them not really having a place in, in restoration situations, but in a small home landscape, if you can pick one, I'll use flocks for an example. I'm gonna pick I'm gonna pick um, Jenna because mm-hmm. that's gonna attract the most butterflies of anything. Um, any of the flocks that we trialed. So, yeah, there, there's a place for it, for sure. Um, and our research is going to continue to try to, um, you know, illustrate the subtleties between um, cultivars and straight species going forward. Now, I know because of the length of the trials, you have trials kind of overlapping at the same time. But when when this ends, especially given the buzz, is it hard to let go, is it hard to walk away and know that this is over now? Like, like I would have a hard time with that. Yeah, I, and so so a little bit of both, like. There's part part of you that like is I'm definitely going to miss having the carrots there. They've been there as long as I've been here, um, and um, but at the same time I'm excited for the next thing. Um, I'm really like we're kind of gearing up for the ironweed trial now, which will complete mm-hmm. we'll be finishing up next year, um, and we're also gearing up for what's going to replace carrots in the shade. Um, so what's coming in next in the spring, we're going to be replacing it with ferns, um, which will not be a generous specific trial, but really just kind of a larger group, um, many different genera. And we're going to be doing a smaller evaluation on Tiarella as well. But the carrots aren't going away at, um, permanently. Um, we're going to be keeping those 16 top performers in the trial garden. So this next spring, you can come with your research report. And you can see those plants in person. Awesome. Um, and it'd be kind of in our top performer bed on the west side of the trial garden. With- with the success of Carrick's, does it change your view, your approach to the trial gardens in the future as far as what you look at, at trialing? Um, I think so. I think like ferns are kind of a logical next step for me. And not that they're similar plants, um, um, you know, botanically speaking, but I think they fill a similar landscape niche. Um, they're kind of an underrepresented and maybe misunderstood group of plants. Uh, and there's a lot of diversity out there as well. Um, well. We won't be testing them in full sun. We will be testing quite a lot of species, a bunch of cultivars, and just trying to untangle some of the mystery around ferns um, for for homeowners, um, for home gardeners. Um, and I'm really excited just from a personal level. I am far from a fern expert, but I'm really excited to learn, which is one of the really great things about the trials in general is I get to learn every day. Yeah. So that's a lot of fun. Um, and I'm, that's one of the reasons I'm so, you know, I'm so excited about the upcoming fern trial in particular. I'm yeah. really jealous, actually, because not only do you get to learn every day, sometimes the best learning is dealing with the same things every day. So, yeah. you know, repetition is always a great key for, for memorization. So it's... It's sure. it's a nice way to so when I have Carrick's questions I know who I'm I'm calling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I was excited to hear you guys were doing ferns as well, um, just because there's a lot of really cool ferns out there that and, and there's plenty that are in the market already, but there's plenty that aren't. And it's easy to be on a hike and just say, oh, there's ferns over there, but then. Knowing what kinds of ferns, I, it's just it opens up this whole new world, and you just see. I don't want to say ferns tend like to grow monocultures, but some of them do. Like they'll, you'll just see a carpet of ferns, and then as you sure. get a little closer, you say, "Well, this these ferns are different than the, this is sensitive fern over here, and this is hay scent fern over here, and they this oh this is getting a little bit more sun, and that's why these ones grow here." Versus, I've always been fascinated with ferns and haven't had a chance to dive in, so I'm yeah. also a little jealous that you're getting to yeah. Do that. 
Uh, well, come on over. It'll be yeah, in the okay. next spring. All right. Awesome. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. That's a date. We'll, we will be there. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, oh, what was I going to say? I just lost my train of thought. Dang it. I, you you got I, I'm not a mind reader. Come on. Friend. Got, come on. I'm sending those. <laughs> well, the other thing you mentioned was the, the Tiarella, which is yeah. another species we don't grow at our nursery, but uh, a lot of other native plant or native plant adjacent nurseries do. And, yeah. um, and I would guess not being that familiar with it, I wasn't familiar that there was that many different species of it or even that many different cultivars of it. Um, so right. that's another interesting thing you guys are doing. Yeah, it, it's going to be fun. Um, I, I love Tiarella. They're a yeah. big, they're a staple in the gardens here at Mount Cuba Center. Um, we're going to have two uh, recognized species in the trial and I believe 17 or 18 different cultivars. Wow. Um, and again, that was another thing that it was surprising when we started doing the research and started seeing, you know, what, what amount of plants can we accumulate? What kind of footprint is it going to take in the trial garden? I mean, it was surprising when we came up with 20 different cultivars and species of Tiarella that we can source today. Yeah. Uh, wow. it's, it's amazing. Well, I think a lot of that, like, I, I think it's Steve Castorani and Dale mm. Hendricks for a lot yep. of those yeah. and, uh, thankful that they've, they've made that a more common place uh, the folks, um, uh, mm-hmm from North Creek nursery. I can't remember Dale's company now, um, what the oh, name of yeah. his company is now, but they, you know, back in the day you would just see Tiarella cordifolia and some of those cultivars right. actually brought some hype to that plant and got more notice as far as the, the native varieties, uh, other than the cultivars. Yeah. So I'm really thankful that they did the work on that. Same with Eucra. Uh, they, yeah. they, they were really pioneering in, in getting the the name of those plants out and getting them seen to a wider public. Yeah, and I was gonna I was gonna say that. Um, so I, it was actually after our last conversation, I went and started getting some cultivars of Tiarella and putting in my home garden, and um, yeah. and it really just changed the the look of our garden to a place where my wife was like, "This looks messy." To okay, you're starting to make it look complete, and. Um, and then we went to Mount Cuba Center, and she saw the TRL, but more so the heuchera that was blooming. <laughs> and she's right. like, oh, I love this plant. This plant's – well, you were just telling me that you didn't like it at home the other day. <laughs> and you guys just do a much better job of presenting that and mixing it with uh, with complementary plants as well. So I, I did remember what I wanted to ask earlier. So when, oh, the, sure. <laughs> the re- when the results come out, is there – other than like an unveiling and the report that people can access, is what else happens with the results of this? Does anyone take those results and, and do more research with it? Have you ever seen like people using that to to take it further or is it just – it's out there for you to learn from and, and elaborate on? Yeah, it, it's out there as a, as a free resource. Again, just trying to help people make good informed decisions, both homeowners, nursery people. Um, I would love to see expanded upon it and um, in the future, um, but it's really just about getting the information out there. Um, as soon as we release it, um, you know, uh, we're, we're just trying to spread the word. I'm um, giving talks, um, coming on uh, podcasts and all that good stuff. Um, just getting the word out there, um, helping people, you know, again, get this information um, into the hands of people who are going to be using it. I, I, I can't express enough how important of a resource Mount Cuba Center is. Everyone that I've ever met that works there has has been some of the most knowledgeable and passionate people uh, that I've met. And the information and knowledge that comes out of Mount Cuba Center is I, – I don't know where we'd be as, as far as a native plant community without it. Uh, so it's really invaluable. I, I just hope everyone realizes that and celebrates that. Um, and this is just one of the wonderful things that the Mount Cuba Center does. And this one is, it, I it, it's the most exciting for me just because of how excited everyone else is getting about it. Um, yeah. Did yeah. like did you see like a weird inflow? Like as soon as the information come out, did you notice like a a, a buzz immediately about it? Yeah, I mean, we just just purely from like an engagement, even just on social media, it just kind of was it was kind of amazing um, how many people were excited, commenting, sharing um, requests for um, you know, various talks and things started rolling in, and people were just there's just excitement. I think also having those classes that are that will be offered um, in the coming weeks also just kind of continues that conversation and gives people another chance to engage um, with this trial. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just been, it's been a lot of fun. And again, like seeing the excitement has just been 
exciting for me. I'm getting excited about carrots all the time. I've always liked them. I think they're great plants. Um, and my goal was if I can inspire someone to grow one carrots in their home garden, we'll, we will have done our job. And it seems like we're, we're getting there for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just a, a quick aside. We mentioned Dale Hendricks. His company is uh, Greenlight Plants LLC. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is, are there any talks that you have coming up that you can promote yet? That, that people can come hear you talk more about this? Yeah, I think other than the um, – other than a couple of podcasts um, that are out there um, and uh, the classes, there's a couple a little bit farther out. Um, but, yeah, okay. I would say stay tuned uh, to Mount Cuba's website for any offerings for, for future engagement. Awesome. So I think – before we ask our final question, did you have any more questions? No, I'm for good, friend. I, right. I, I'm really excited for this last question. <laughs> <laughs> so this is – not too many guests get this because we don't get too many return guests, but it's redemption time. If you want to change, we always ask what your favorite native plant is. Last <laughs> oh time you gosh. mentioned Emstonia and Baptisia as two of your favorites. Yeah. You have just did this exciting Carex trial. Do you want to yeah. change your answer? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Hardest question – Oh, this is this is the most unfair question for, <laughs> for someone who's into into plants, and we we ask this in interviews, and it's always like it's tough. I'm like, here's the hardest question of the day, um, and it's a sim- it's a simple question, but it's it depends. It's like asking someone what their favorite song is. It can change yeah. on your mood, and it's it's or what your experiences have been lately. So it's it's yeah. interesting to see if you've changed. Uh, or, yeah. or or just today, if you have a different native uh, favorite plant. Yeah, I so I I still love Baptisians and Amsonia. I love Carex. Um, I really um, lately have been getting really into Stilphium. Um, just yeah. at home, I think that's a great genus um, and some really cool underappreciated species out there. Uh, I just yeah, I don't robust plants that have staying power. You're, you don't have to do much for them, for them to be giving back to you, both ornamentally and to wildlife in your home landscape. Those are the plants that just tick all the boxes for me. Um, but yeah, it's changed a little bit, but it's just maybe just gotten more diverse. I don't know if I could ever narrow it down to a single species. <laughs> well, you, the, the beautiful part about that question is that there's no no wrong answer. Like there aren't right. any wrong – every answer is right <laughs> answer. So no, that's it's wonderful choices, and it's 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 hard especially when you get – you know, you get excited, especially when you're learning something new about plants that you already knew, and and you kind of fall in love with them all over again. And it's it's hard not right. to be passionate about something when you're you're learning all of its wonderful attributes and what it offers to the world. And yeah. it's it's uh, I don't know. I part of me would be disappointed if you kept the same plant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I I should say that um, another group that I have been really excited about lately is Pycnanthemum. Um, I think that they are such a cool, it's such a cool genus. And just a little plug, we are currently planning a Pycnanthemum trial, um, which will be following the Ironweed trial. This, it will be planted, I think, in October. Um, so I'm very, very excited about that. Like, yeah. That's, you know what, I'm very excited about that one. And there, there's definitely a, a buzz prior, just for deer um uh, resistance, deer resistance. Yeah. There's definitely a buzz yeah. about that, but I've I've recently fallen a lo- in love with that plant mm-hmm. uh, with how yeah. versatile it is, and it's I'm excited oh, about that one. Value. Oh yeah, like yep. it's just unbelievable. Like yeah, it's it's incredible. Yeah, I mean I mean talk about a plant that's just hitting a home run. It's it's got right. so much. So so I'm I'm curious about that too. You're smiling. Yeah. What, what it's because uh, I just started thinking how many how many phone calls and emails and. Facebook comments are we going to get that we didn't say enough common names after Patel names this oh, week? <laughs> no, it's it's no, what, it's, but, but here's, we actually here's, have a good thing to say here because you could you don't have to write to us about it. You can go and go online and go to the Mount Cuba Center and get this or their website, get this report, and it has all the translations there. So actually, yeah. what I do, what I was doing really, and just pull this up as you're listening. I'm of course I'm telling you this at the end. <laughs> but yeah if you if you had, were frustrated that we were doing that a lot and not saying the common names go pull up the trial and then as we're talking about stuff just flip to the different pages and it's like you'll see what we're talking about and you'll see the pictures that we're we're referencing the stories sam's telling you'll be able to, to 
kind of comprehend it a little bit better. But but here's a perfect example why it was important for us to use botanical names, especially mm-hmm. with Carex, because you think of Carex cornata, which is broom sedge, mm-hmm. but broom sedge is also Andropogon virginicus. So when you're thinking of common names, they overlap genuses sometimes and and different parts of the country or different things so if you for us to really adequately discuss these plants so that you would understand would be the botanical name cross reference we we want you to go download this report Mm -hmm. look at the spreadsheet cross references get to know this become as excited become as excited about this as we are because this is there's a reason for this and it's it's important and and this is going to there's going to be a change in the landscape Quite figuratively yeah. speaking. So, all right, this is this has been awesome. This is where we we're we're hoping we can do this with you every year. Like we we oh, get. I would, I would love that. Yeah, it's I. Always, it's always a lot of fun. I I would love that too because here we are. It's it's still winter, but we're already thinking about spring and we're getting excited. And now I can't wait. Now I'm like, oh, it's January still. Like I want it to be March and April. Let's get <laughs> let's let's get going. Yes. But this is the, the, the point in the show where we do final thoughts, and we always hand the floor over to you first, and you can use the time to summarize, promote something, uh, mention something we didn't mention, but however you want to use it, it's it's all yours. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, thank you both so much for having me. It's it's really is a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I would just say, like, um, check out our future programs offerings. Check out the research report. Check out that that Excel file um, that you can download and sort. I think that will be really useful for a home home gardener. Just generating lists for plants that might work for your home landscape. Um, in addition, on our website, we have detailed descriptions of every single of of all the seventy carrots that we evaluated. We have descriptions for all of them, including photos. Um, so that's also a resource to go through. And again, because it wasn't a top performer in the trial, that just means it means it wasn't adaptable or well-suited to average garden conditions. But there's not a bad carex out there. There really is a carex for every single garden. Um, and come see them this spring. Um, they'll be, the top performers will still be in the garden. We open up April 1st. Um, and stay tuned for the, the fern trial and the Tirella trial that are going in in late April, or probably they'll be in the ground by late April. They'll be going in the middle of the month. Um, and there's a lot of upcoming things. Um, Vernonia is up next. That research report will be out next spring. And we'll be following that with um, Mountain Men, which, again, very, very excited about. But thank you so much again for having us. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, we, we appreciate it. And Tom and I yeah. will be there this spring. We've, yes. we've yes. made a commitment. Yes. We're we're doing. It. I don't know what date yet, but we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, we'll be live on location. That's what they oh. say on the news, right? Yeah, yeah live so. on location. Yeah. Do you want to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we're we we want to do a little live recording. We're 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 gonna try some experimentation. Yeah. I guess so. yeah, podcasts are never really live. They can be, but you can do. It's... We could do a live show, but we <laughs> but we're gonna record on location. Yeah, we're gonna yeah, we want to walk around and kind of see some stuff and actually record while we're doing it and. Um, awesome. It's really going to test our worth as uh, how many words we know to <laughs> yeah. describe things. But there's some cool technology <laughs> yes. coming out that we're just waiting for it to hit. And also sure. expensive technology yeah. for him. Oh, I, did, I, did I you look oh, you oh, oh, I bet, Okay. All right. But uh, no, we, yeah, we got to talk about that more. But okay. my final thought was years ago, I listened to Cloudy West, who was also on the podcast uh, a while ago, um, give a presentation and uh, and – just explain the importance of all the different layers when you're you're doing like an eco centric garden and like how you right. need that ground. You don't want just want mulch. You need that green mulch almost in a way. You want that plant plant layer that's like zero inches to twelve inches. Something there that's like works as a weed suppressor. That's how it happens yeah. in in nature. And Carex Pennsylvanica has kind of been the champion for most people in the garden. It was for me because you think yeah. of like all the other Characters I knew were wetland characters, and I tried. Someone gave me some characters Appalachia, and it didn't really work that great for me. Um, so it's nice to have like some other places to turn that are like, oh, just for my home garden. Oh, I can try this. I can try this, um, and I'm excited about that because it's such an important layer, and you tie in like the TRL and the Heuchera. Uh It just creates that aesthetic that personally I'm trying to go for, and I think a lot of our listeners are trying to go for as well. Yeah, I yeah. I think for me, what I'm most excited about is just um, the shift in acknowledgement or acceptance of native plants. I think had you done this Carrick's trial 15 years ago, I, I 
I don't want to say it would have fell on deaf ears, but I don't know that it would have gotten yeah. the same buzz because there wasn't the same kind of awareness uh, in today's culture to, right. to do more for the ecosystem and the food chain. And I'm happy that this is perfect timing, that this is hitting at a time where people are craving this type of information and looking for these solutions, and it's solving a real issue for people that want to do more for our ecosystem, and the timing couldn't be better, and and I feel that – the results of this are going to take that awareness and level to another level, which is even more exciting, um, and I can't wait to see I, – I, I am sure at some point there will be a Margaret Roach New York Times article mm-hmm. about championing Carrick's, yeah. and, and because of these trials is going to br- bring a new awareness to so many new people, um, and and hopefully this is something that becomes mainstream and you mm-hmm. see Carrick's lawns yeah. or, or Carrick's incorporate it. <laughs> More into landscapes, and it's nice that we're at a time where it can be accepted and digested in a way that it needs to be. And I can't thank yeah. you more for this. I, this is – we were excited to come into this. I'm even more excited coming out of it, and that's what you want. And I, I hope our listeners walk away with that same excitement, and we're, we're happy to be able to provide everyone with a little bit more information, and mm-hmm. we couldn't do it without you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, it's, it's our pleasure. Um, absolutely. Awesome. I think that's I think that's about yeah. wraps it up. Yeah, so that's going to wrap us up for today. Thank you for listening to Native Plants Healthy Planet presented by Pinelands Nursery. Uh, if you want more information on Mount Cuba Center, it is – oh, I had it pulled up here, and now I lost it, didn't I? It's MT it's, Yeah, Cuba. mtcubacenter.org, MT standing for Mount. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then there's the section on programs that Sam mentioned before. If you go there, it'll show some of the upcoming classes, which they don't just have character classes. They have all kinds of stuff, and they even have yeah. – I was looking through. They have like a backlog of some of the stuff they've had before where you can watch it virtually and um, like the, see one on instant rain gardens and fabulous flocks and eco gardening, plain and simple. There's all kinds of different stuff through a variety of really great educators yeah. that you can check out if, there. And if you're in the area, please go visit because you mm-hmm. have the best of both worlds. You can see a little bit more of a formal garden anywhere to a natural area and, and experience it all. I would, and really I would even soul. take it a step further and say this is a place you should put as like a destination to visit on your at some point. List. I know, a bucket list. And I know we've had uh, – I'm thinking of people from Tennessee who said, oh, I have it on my list. I'm going to make a trip specifically to go here. So, And there's a lot of stuff that you can visit Philadelphia, see the – History, oh, yeah. go down to Mount Cuba, go to the Jersey Shore. We got a lot to offer in this neck of the woods. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. So, <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. <laughs> so, so, all right. So thank you, everyone, for listening to Native Plants Healthy Planet presented by Pinelands Nursery. We, as always, we're going to say thank you to the egocentric plastic men for contributing our theme music to our Meet Our Guest episodes. Make sure you stream or buy their uh, music wherever you consume your music. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at Pineland nursery at facebook at pinelands nursery nj instagram, instagram at native plants healthy or native plants underscore healthy planet or at pinelands nursery and you can check us out also at youtube at pinelands nursery uh, don't forget about the question and comment line call us at 215-346-6189 i will repeat that 215-346-6189 ask a question or leave a comment we'll try to play it on a future episode of the buzz and answer it to the best of our ability and, uh, man, the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group has exploded again. The amount of new uh, members and the conversations, you know, like anything, it kind of ebbs and flows, and it's it's cresting right now. So uh, make sure you join the group and be part of the conversation. I'm sure this episode is going to be a part of that conversation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, and it already has been because you can find the report there. So yes. um, you can buy Native Plants Healthy Planet merch by going to our website, www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. We have a little banner at the top that will take you to our Teespring store, and uh, and there's all kinds of cool designs over there up there. We were wearing them at our trade show we were. two weeks ago. We'll be ago. wearing them We'll be wearing week. them at our trade shows that we're going to next week. Um, they're also very comfortable, yes, which, I, which I really like about a shirt because there's nothing worse than wearing an itchy <laughs> shirt all day. I agree, but um, especially to a trade show. Yeah. So, and we don't keep any of the the profits from that. They all go to organizations that we, as we go through this, say, hey, we'd love to support this group or that group. So. Uh, that's where that money goes. Um, you can listen to Native Plants Healthy Planet at our website, www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. But you're probably going to listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you're listening now. You know where to find us. Um, when you're there, if you can do us a big favor, leave us a five-star review. Hit subscribe. It goes a long, long way. 
uh, for us. And if you do a little write up with those five star reviews, I'll give you a plug on our listener shout out section of our buzz episode. So, uh, with that, thank you, everyone. I'm Tom. And I am France. Sam, again, thank you. I can't thank you enough for being a part of this. It's always a pleasure. We're looking forward to this becoming a reoccurring uh, theme. And uh, I want to thank everyone again for joining in. Next week we have our Buzz episode, so make sure you tune in. And until then, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.